I start the second lecture. <laughs> Jan? Yeah. Yes, you, you can continue with the second lecture, yes. Yeah, uh, okay. So again, yeah, if you, if we, we suffer kind of in, internet problems, just, just let me know, right? Yeah. Um, okay. uh? If there is a problem, uh, we will let you know. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, hopefully it goes smooth. Um, so welcome to the, the second lecture or second part of the lecture. Uh, this will be, I mean, a little bit more, more practical also, I mean, also based on, 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 on research, but, but mainly on, on this dialogue between, you know, the, 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 the world of research and, and then the world of industrial development and, and, and design for, for today, right? Um, so whereas some of the projects that I was describing before are kind of envisioning a new future uh, that is somehow becoming more and more palpable. Uh, and Nagami is and has to be as a real company, right? Uh, working on, uh, on kind of the latest stage of the current, <laughs> the current present, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, Nagami is, is a, um, a robotic manufacturing company that I created together with, uh, with my partners, uh, and Miguel Angel, who is my brother, and, uh, and Ignacio, one of my, my best friends uh, in, in Spain, um, in, in Avila. And it was uh, basically trying to, to push this, these technologies of uh, automation and additive distributed manufacturing uh, to the real world, basically beyond uh, all examples that we kind of kept on, on scene for the last few years on just, you know, 3D printing small objects at, at, at home or 3D printing big pieces with, with large budgets for exhibitions and, and, and museums. Um, uh, 3D printing, as you, as you know, and I will kind of like, dig a little bit more into that is establishing a, an incredibly sore production chain and this is this is a contrapoint on the henry ford uh, assembly line model right? um henry ford obviously played a, a massive uh, role in making the the car accessible right and the, the key for making this car accessible was well first of all to strip it out of all unnecessary components but then also mainly to repeat that car over and over and find out a very, very uh, efficient way of uh, manufacturing these pieces in an assembly line and uh, uh, yeah, which will kind of uh, lead to uh, the repetition of that, that same car over and over and uh, therefore uh, getting a manufacturing cost to a very, very low price and uh, expanding the adoption of this, this uh, automation technology to, to the masses, right? And, and that is obviously an incredibly uh, important moment in, in the evolution of, of uh, the automobile. Um, however, I mean, uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of manufacturing method that has, it is still present today, right? It's established in a very long and wasteful production chain, right? You need an entire kind of, yeah, line of, of machines and, and, and uh, operators connected in line uh, to manufacture one single product. And it also requires an obvious, very init uh, high initial investment uh, per product. So you need to establish the entire production line before you can start manufacturing. Uh, this in the, let's say in the furniture industry, led to an obvious repetition of uh, identical copies of the same, right? Um, so and that's why we keep on seeing the, the same chairs over and over and over, uh, because the, the production line is established to manufacture that one single product. And to offset that cost, you need to repeat that product and in numerous uh, kind of uh, times, right? Uh, 3D printing, on the other hand, is, is kind of the, the complete 
a reverse process. So we, um, we can have an incredibly short production chain due to its versatility, right? So it's a, a one machine uh, that can translate a digital design into reality in a single step, right? And, and this also uh, allows an, an on-demand production, right? So you can only produce what you need uh, because every single product product could also be a slightly uh, different, uh, which is again uh, a, a complete kind of a reverse thinking from the Henry Henry Ford model, where rather than having a multiplicity of machines connected to uh, create a single product, uh, we have just one machine which can produce an infinite number of variations. Um, 3D printing is also kind of um, a op opening uh, the, the, the door for, for the power of, of distributed uh, digital manufacturing. Um, so uh, as um, a 3D printer could be um, uh, situated in, in, in different parts of the world and it could actually print the same object simultaneously worldwide, uh, we are changing completely the model of the factory to a network-based model. Um, if you are 3D printing pieces, those pieces could be 3D printed locally or in many different parts of the world and uh, assemble them together. And this has been demonstrated uh, very clearly in, um, uh, during, this, during this crisis, um, actually at the, at the very beginning of this crisis, where it became evident that we couldn't supply uh, enough uh, PPEs for the demand that was generated in, in, in hospitals. Um, so our health workers were, were unprotected. That um, uh, happened very, very early in, in Spain. And uh, as uh, unfortunately, my country was incredibly uh, hit by the, by the crisis in a very early stage. And we just couldn't cope with, with the demand. So um, uh, makers from, from all over the world uh, jumped immediately to see how they could help uh, in, um, to alleviate this, this, this crisis. We, there, there were even conversations at the, at the very beginning of, uh, of uh, this unfortunate moment when it was still kind of uh, located in the Far East. Um, where uh, we were discussing how we can make use of uh, a technology that can immediately jump to a complete new, new product uh, to supply for uh, uh, an excessive demand that was appearing very suddenly, right? Um, so jumping or changing the object that you are printing from anything to a, to a face seal uh, it's just a matter of seconds. And it, this happened all over the world. And then um, makers uh, worldwide started to rethink or, or to think how 3D printed technologies could contribute to produce uh, new objects that will be extremely uh, necessary uh, in these times. So therefore, uh, this crisis basically made it very obvious that the centralized model that we were all following, and uh, let's say in this specific case, most of the PPE were uh, produced in China. China was the first one being hit by the, by the crisis. So when it came to the rest of the world, China was already in deficit and couldn't cope with the incredible demand generated worldwide. Uh, so we obviously um, jump in immediately to try to help and we shift our entire uh, manufacturing uh, line to to producing producing PPE, um, which uh, thanks to our robotic manufacturing methods, uh, we were um, actually cre creating one uh, one uh, every minute or so with four robots. Uh, so that was obviously incredibly helpful, and uh, we started supplying uh, local hos uh, hospitals and. Um, immediately. So, so I think that the, the impact of uh, such a worldwide project goes much beyond the crisis. Uh, it's um, also starting to envision a completely different way of not only manufacturing, 
but also distributing, uh, where everyone basically had a, I think that was here, yeah, like six years ago, already 750 million people had access to a 3D printer within 10 miles of their home. Yeah. Ryan, that's six years ago. Obviously, today, the uh, number is much higher, and this is leading to a, an incredible reduction on CO2 emissions with a reduction of, of uh, long-range uh, shipping on top of the very, very short and clean production uh, chain that is implicit to this manufacturing method. Um, 3D printing also obviously can lead with a deal with a multiplicity of materials, and we've been um, seeing uh, a large variety of, of examples. Uh, but in our case, we decided very early on to work with a, with a material that is unfortunately an unlimited uh, resource and will probably be forever plastic, right? Um, I, I tend to see that uh, plastic is the material of the future, but this is a complete kind of different statement as when uh, it was framed in the, in the 70s and the, and the 80s. Uh, plastic will be with us forever and, um, and it will keep on creating artificial islands and, uh, and generate microplastics that, that will um, dramatically damage our health if we don't do anything about it. And uh, I think since it's there, and it will be there forever, I think it's our duty, if we can use it, to use it and bring it to a, 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 a new form and a new life uh, that is perhaps and obviously much more needed than what we are seeing right now on the screen. Uh, today, in only 10% uh, of plastic uh, is, is recycled. Um, this is, this is uh, incredibly alarming. And uh, I think we do have the power right now, technically, uh, to deal with this in a much more uh, clever manner. Um, that is actually part of our uh, main aim in a company. And we, we have a, a partnership with, with Parley, uh, which is a worldwide organization uh, who are uh, trying very actively and fighting very actively to clean our oceans. Um, so they are uh, uh, and doing all uh, kind of upcycling uh, events and campaigns to clean our coastlines and start transforming this plastic into beautiful products or sometimes, as in this case, uh, to very necessary products. Um, so. I mean, it's, it's obviously um, in, incredibly uh, touching for us to see that we, we could contribute to, uh, to this, uh, but es especially to, to see that that would allow them to, to do their job, which is save our lives. That was incredible. Uh, but I think the, the kind of the power of that project goes beyond um, uh, COVID-19. And, and is uncovering an entire potential of uh, these new design methods and these new uh, um, technologies to start become, uh, becoming a, a much larger player in, in industry. So as I, as I mentioned before, yeah, automation, we, we saw automation as a, as a design more a, a design problem, more a, an opportunity, right? Uh, in this case, it was, was a necessary opportunity. And, um, and the, the question also at this scale, is that, let's say again, the, the scale of the product that we deal with in, in Nagami is how can we design for and with kind of in a, in a, in a stable relationship with uh, automation uh, technologies. Um, so our 3D printing um, uh, process uh, allows for, let's say, certain material aspects to, to be developed that were impossible to achieve with traditional manufacturing techniques. Um, because of the way the, these objects are understood, as, a, as an object that is almost drawn in 3D uh, with like a, a kilometers of extruded plastic deposited on, on, on top of each other, right? Uh, you can actually start changing the property of, uh, of the object locally, right? You can change colors, you can change opacities. And I think this is an, an incredible 
um, opportunity for us to play with in the domain of furniture, but also as we will see further on in the lecture in the level of architecture. Um, so, so we developed a, um, a kind of a short catalog of, of products, mainly, mainly chairs, and also in collaboration with, uh, with external uh, designers and, um, and architects who would have this kind of digital way of thinking and understanding of the technology and, and will be am ambitious and visionary enough to challenge our techniques, to create a product that was not possible to conceive otherwise. Right? Um, so, I'm just going to uh, quickly run through some of these objects. Um, this is a, a pillar by, by Daniel Widrick. Um, pillar is, is actually capitalizing on something that has always been fundamental for us, which is um, efficiency, right? So, in this case, um, Daniel is, is really pushing this double curvature to the, to the very limit so that you can still print without support and within uh, a contained time space, right? Like this, um, this uh, uh, chair prints in, in eight hours only, and, and is uh, really uh, playing with the maximum angle that you, you can achieve with, a, with a, an FDM uh, processing, printing at a scale. Uh, Ross uh, Lovegrove, um, Kind of joined uh, this this venture back then in Milan, and is still uh, an, an an incredibly uh, is still incredibly committed to to the company, and we're we're still uh, working very closely. Um, he he was uh, focusing on uh, these kind of opportunities that these different uh, pigmentations could allow you. I think uh, this video. I'm not sure if it's gonna uh, play nicely uh, with my with my internet, but if it doesn't, please check online. I think Ross describes kind of the 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 new mentality that you need to have as a designer for dealing with these technologies and the new opportunities that they bring uh, much nicer than than uh, I could ever do. So I, I'm just gonna let it play, and if it doesn't work, please check it online. When you're faced with, with something like that, remember these forms that in the past maybe you draw, it certainly couldn't make them unless you had somebody spending weeks doing it. So I, I, I think we shouldn't underestimate the freedom that contemporary technologies give a third time life. But you need the kind of uh, you need both, you know, you need a design mind that just kind of moves things up. So that algorithmic mind you know, step in and understand the complexity of mathematics. You're building it without a more. And I'd like to bring in new species, new things that people have never seen before. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, Ross is uh, is uh, really uh, framing very very nicely this kind of dialogue that we need to start having as as designers, makers, programmers interested in in, in technology manufacturers, and uh, and I think this, this product that um, and most products that we we create in Nagami are a result of that dynamism. Um, so the the collaboration with the with the uh, Saha Hadid, the architects, and, and with uh, Patrick uh, Schumacher uh, was uh, incredibly interesting and challenging as well. So we we kind of put ourselves a new new problem in printing in this scale that it was printing over uh, an object that you have already printed, <laughs> right? So um, and we had to like the 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 form uh, was so so radically different in both sides that we had to uh, develop a, a method to uh, gradually change the thickness of extrusion from uh, uh, half a millimeter to nine, nine millimeters. And you would have to also print in three dimensions, uh, not uh, plain slices. I'll, I'll run through that in a second. And 
uh, this one you, you can also check check online. But I'll, I'll uh, try to describe. Patrick describes the object much much uh, better than me. But uh, um, essentially, the, the very big challenge that we we had in this object was, as, as you can see in the screen, how you can first print an object and and then print over it. plastic shrinks, right? So that was <laughs> incredibly challenging. If, if we would just have a three D model and we would just keep on printing, then going back. Uh, to print in the surface, uh, that wouldn't have worked. So we had to scan the object when uh, printed and readapt this uh, pattern parametrically. And, uh, and I think uh, this kind of started to open new opportunities also if you think about like uh, ar architectural elements, especially cladding and so on, where printing um, bypasses the limitation and being like um, to the uh, kind of con contour lines over an object um, that, of course, in a makerbot, you can uh, you can very easily follow because because the the, the plastic extrusion is very thin. But when the plastic extrusion, is, and as you can see here, when the line becomes uh, really part of 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 the object, it becomes part of the design. Uh, you you start really computing the way this line can generate a form and uh, and the way this line needs to uh, kind of flow within this object differently um, and I think that understanding of the of, uh, of this uh, object at the material level uh, is uh, incredibly interesting when, when we talk about 3d printing um, we did a second chair as well with um, it's a Hadid architect. This is a rice, and uh, you can see in this video. This is this is more of a back, backstage uh, video, so uh, um, and uh, kind of uh, what, how the robot is is dancing sometimes at, uh, at five in the morning. Uh, but you can see that there is an. Um, this is not a scaled up version of a desktop 3D printer. It's not a maker bot, right? Like we we don't. Uh, slice an object in horizontal layers, but we actually compute those layers three-dimensionally, and and the robot needs to use its seven axes to to locate itself in the in the best position to pour the the plastic in a certain way with a certain thickness to uh, create that certain curvature. Uh, so the entire project is kind of a, a combination of this iterative uh, parametric design and adjustment on uh, the overall move of the machine with the, the, the local kind of uh, uh, amount of plastic that you're pouring. So, so uh, everything is, a, is, is, a, is one cycle from, from, the, from the, the nozzle to the overall thinking of, of the object. Uh, so we launched the, the company in, in Milan in, in 2018. Uh, that was uh, incredibly uh, fun and, to be honest, really, really refreshing. And uh, we went there with the prototypes, but then, but then uh, we developed these uh, products faster. Um, like uh, this is the the final product of the of the um, uh, rice chair with uh, Saha Adit, and uh, that has been exhibited in uh, different venues, such as this one is in, in Dubai, this is a Hadid uh, gallery. But also we started collaborating with other companies, especially, I don't know, for some reason, the, uh, again, in this lecture, the automotive company uh, kind of uh, comes into play. So this is a collaboration that we did with BMW. So um, in, the, in this case, BMW was uh, very interested in, in uh, uh, 3D printing uh, technologies, but also how they can uh, then admit different number of layers as, as a car does, right? Um, to then become, become a, a, a different product, right? So in this case, we're, we're uh, tinting 
the, the uh, Daniel Sher and, and some of my own pieces uh, with the uh, same uh, colorants that they, they use for the BMW M8. Uh, more and almost simultaneously, we were doing also a collaboration with, with Audi in, in Dubai. And I think the, this was really interesting for us uh, because it kind of tips um, much more to the side that we, we are more interested in uh, the company to, to develop further, which is products that are not just a single expression and a single piece, but products that could get to everyone's home, right? Like 3D printing, furniture that could be uh, accessible. And uh, we um, made that possible uh, thanks to uh, the, the development of, of, our own, of our own tools uh, to, to print incredibly fast and safe and efficiently. Uh, so in this case, um, we're printing uh, the, the chair in three, three to uh, four hours which reduces the manufacturing costs tremendously. And um, therefore, uh, it makes this uh, uh, object much more, much, um, or it, it kind of gets in a bracket of a very competitive uh, price uh, to make 3D printing a reality in, in commercial, uh, commercial furniture. Um, so, We've been uh, developing a series of uh, products. These are some of my own uh, design uh, pieces that are um, a little bit more, let's say, um, more normal, more uh, down to earth in, in terms of, the, of the, uh, their formal uh, expression, uh, but that we are also using to uh, start inserting new materials in our manufacturing line. For example, right now we're sifting most of uh, our materials to work with the uh, ocean plastics for, from, from Parley. And kind of aiming to have an incredibly clean, sustainable and efficient technique to bring these uh, uh, products to, to everyone's homes. Uh, well, this is not everyone's homes. This is uh, Theo, Theo Lali's uh, Epsilon Villa, which is uh, incredible. So it's the, the best background for, for these chairs. Uh, but it is um, really a, an example on, on, on how this object could be used in everyday life. So for, for some reason, at the very beginning, we always had this this question when people would see our objects and say, well, can I see this? Well, of course, it's a chair. And I think that this is what is, what is important. We are not uh, doing research for the sake of it. Uh, we are doing research to uh, really make this pro uh, these uh, products uh, available to a wider audience. Uh, we also kind of, uh, within the, this uh, uh, collaboration environment, uh, we are um, I as well participate in a more challenging projects like uh, this one is for, for the NASA 3D printed uh, habitat challenge uh, with, uh, together with Hustle and uh, really stipulating how, uh, speculating how we can uh, 3D print um, uh, objects in Mars with uh, the, the Martian waste, right? Like with, with, the, with the waste that the astronauts are continuously generating there, can we then upcycle them and uh, transform them in, in new products and re-transforming them again uh, to feed the necessities rather than waiting for an incredibly long, long range shipping from, from planet Earth. Um, so we um, exhibited this product, uh, this project in, in the Design Museum uh, last year in an, uh, um, a Moving to Mars uh, exhibition where we, we brought uh, kind of a, a variety of different objects using the, uh, translucent uh, PETG. Um, as um, as I, I saw, and I, I actually frame even before as well, um, we are testing most of our ideas in the scale of furniture. Um, first, because it is an, an industry that is also waiting to be revolutionized through these digital technologies. And, uh, and it is also easier to tap into, right? Uh, obviously, 
uh, it is easier to start 3D printing furniture rather than 3D printing pieces for buildings, uh, but also because it established the guidelines for further development in an architectural scale. As I mentioned before, most architects uh, have tested their ideas first in, in furniture pieces. Uh, probably uh, Reedbell is the is the, the, the most kind of visible uh, example, uh, but it goes through an entire range from uh, Fran Yorvai to Fran Gehry to Gaudi and, and so on. And it's because the chair is an incredibly architectural uh, object. So that is what we've been doing until now so far. However, in parallel, we're taking um, these um, technical developments in our, in our, in our own uh, 3D printing methods to push the scale much, much uh, uh, higher and to in, in objects like uh, this one that we recently developed with uh, Ross Lovegrove, uh, which is three and a half uh, meter column uh, printed in a single sort of 48 hours. Uh, so I think this object is obviously taken um, kind of the, the, the development that we did for, for the furniture to a larger scale. So it, it conserves this incredible uh, 3D printing uh, quality uh, and, and this uh, level of, of efficiency and, and reliability, but it, it helps us to envision uh, the scale of architecture when it's printed. And so if, if this column could be printed in, in 48 hours, uh, you can already start thinking on uh, uh, how long it would take to 3D print an entire house and how that, that house could, could be, right? And that's something that we, we uh, speculate on uh, a lot. And uh, we develop kind of intermediate scale uh, projects like this uh, 3D printed uh, sleeping capsule uh, that are kind of in between the domain of architecture and the and the domain of, of furniture, and also participate in more experimental kind of events, like this one with, uh, uh, again, with, with Hassel and, and Xavier de Castellier for uh, uh, the robotics atelier in uh, Norman Foster Foundation uh, last year, when we started to uh, investigate how these pieces could have different, different qualities, how they could be assembled in different ways, how if they could surface uh, concrete foam work, if they could keep the flexibility, if they would become cladding or a structure or a little bit of everything uh, combined together, and how a, a, a completely 3D printed architecture would look like, right? Um, and that is uh, something that has always been in the back of our heads, right? Uh, how we could 3D print architecture, but that we're really trying to develop in. Um, uh, some of the uh, research projects that we're uh, taking on that I will explain in, in a second. Uh, but just to, to come back for a second, obviously, 3D printing, we didn't invent 3D printing architecture, N uh, neither were the, the first ones uh, thinking about it. Uh, so um, Cosnevix in, in, in USC was one of the very first ones envisioning this process and thinking, well, if, if we can make a, a 3D printer a machine that is, is bigger than the building, we could, of course, 3D print the building in the same manner. However, um, the scalability of this process is not that direct. And, and we could see how challenging uh, 3D, 3D printing architecture could be, but also uh, we, we can start to question if this is the right method to 3D print this kind of architecture, right? Uh, and, you know, perhaps uh, looking at these examples, there are more efficient uh, methods to materialize uh, these uh, uh, typologies. And this is actually not utilizing 3D printing at uh, its uh, best. Um, on the other hand, and uh, especially focusing on, on, on efficiency, just as in other examples like my colleagues in, in ETH, uh, but who are uh, focusing much more in offsite 3D printing, who are conscious of the, the limitations on the environment within printing. And they're also seeing 
3D printing as a as an very materially efficient method rather than just an in, incredibly complex uh, formal uh, compile a very short compile list um, uh, about the, the um, of uh, 3D printing, right? Um, so we can have on demand production, uh, the short production chain. Uh, we can reduce the number of parts and we can have an incredibly high level of customization. However, and as I was kind of hinting at before, uh, obviously, um, architecture is made out of parts, and uh, the dream on 3D printing a, a building in one go is still really far ahead. Um, certainly true, but within limits. Um, like these are, for example, tests for printing a single a single object. Uh, you can see in here. Um, so although you, you might think that these, these uh, different prototypes are exactly the same, actually I, I can notice this different distribution in the gradient. This gradient is indicating a uh, printability of the object, right? Like when uh, um, a surface will be more stiff or not for the, for the, for the printing. And, and we kind of kept on prototyping this object over and over again. Uh, to the level of spending uh, 500 kilos of, of, uh, of plastic, uh, 300 printing hours and three months of rationalization and engineering uh, to create a single object, uh, which starts to kind of question the model of uh, uh, 3D printing as the ultimate tool for variability. It's not, it's not essentially true that you can do every object completely different but it is true that if you start understanding the parameters that you can play with, you can uh, make a, not a compromise, but rather a dialogue in between the formal opportunities that you have with 3D printing and its efficiency, right? Um, so let's say if uh, um, 3D printing has actually uh, commonly from the very beginning be associated to parametricism, and to uh, create every single form differently. So um, now suddenly, uh, we, it, this was, this was the, the, the dream for, for uh, kind of the, the continuous space movement. No? It, it doesn't matter what you, what you design and as continuous it will be, you can just 3D print it. Um, which is opposed completely to 4D, right? Which is, uh, again, capitalizing more on the, the repetition of, uh, of an object so that you can control that object perfectly and uh, fine tune it to make it as, efficiency, uh, as efficient as possible. So in the case of, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, yeah, parametric uh, uh, structures, um, 3D printing is, a, is the right match at this scale, at the scale of the, of the object. And uh, especially with SLS printing, it's true. Uh, you can actually print anything you want almost, right? Uh, but when you change the scale to the scale of architecture, you start having more problems. So whereas in, in Fordism, uh, you will have an, a huge headache at the beginning to create your entire production line, uh, but then you can output the same object over and over uh, uh, again and uh, know almost certainly that it will be uh, efficient. Um, in parametric system, it will be, or if, if you want to 3D print the, the, a different piece uh, every time, you will just have a repetition of, of a very similar headache uh, every time you try to rationalize it. Um, which basically led to um, parametric system and 3D printing together to be only directed to uh, 1%, right? Whereas Fordism was actually trying to make a product accessible to the 99%, to, to, the, to the wide range of, of uh, society. And so let's say uh, if um, uh, it is certainly true uh, that at the, at the scale of an object, uh, 3D printing and para uh, parametricism are, uh, could, could go in a, in a marriage. Uh, when we're uh, establishing new scales, um, 
three D printing is 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 really opening an an incredibly new and interesting field with in between these two spaces, right? So it's actually not that um, uh, sound for uh, printing a complete different object over and over and over. It's also not the most efficient way for repeating the same object a million times, uh, since obviously the use of, of molds would still be cheaper. However, is opening an entire new field where um, the additions are shorter, where you can make customizations within parameters, where you don't need uh, a um, and to produce a million pieces to be able to take on manufacturing, but you can start immediately with short editions, with uh, 500 um, iterations, with the, with the slight differences, right? Which I think in, within the domain of architecture, when we start acknowledging the limitations of the technology and its opportunities, is really starting the way it's really starting to allow us to rethink the, the, the way we deal with an architecture when we are putting uh, such a manufacturing technology in the very core of it. Um, so whereas, again, parametricism was uh, kind of materialized for buildings, for, for the 1%, the for, for landmarks, um, and, and, and Fordism was trying to make an object accessible uh, to the wide range. I think somewhere in between uh, large scale 3D printing uh, has an entire new uh, field of opportunities. Um, so, so the question uh, that this is posing is if, if uh, art, uh, automation and distributed manufacturing will actually open uh, a new market for, for, for products and, and certainly for, for architecture. And what are the design methods for, with, and for uh, out, out the, uh, process. And um, that's something that we, we've been kind of investigating together in between the, the, um, the UCL uh, the automatic uh, architecture company and, and, and Nagami uh, to see how these uh, kind of protocols could gain efficiency and augment their impact in the, in the design discourse. And I, um, I'm gonna go through a series of, of uh, projects, especially the, this, these four that are uh, dealing with, uh, with um, kind of a narrower uh, approach to increase efficiency in 3D printing, which in this case is um, serializing the possible errors that you can uh, get in a, in the print. Uh, essentially, when like the, the nightmare of uh, any designer when is, uh, or, or any manufacturer utilizing 3D, printer, uh, 3D printing is that uh, after you know, 24 hours, there is a mistake in the geometry and the entire print uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, is failing. Um, so um, what I'm gonna describe in these projects is different methods to kind of avoid that and also play with uh, those constraints as a design opportunity instead. Um, at, at a certain um, scale, um, I think uh, as I was kind of de describing before in the way we're prototyping and generating objects, one of the possible solutions is, um, is a, a discrete 3D printing architecture right so um it's discrete but uh, but uh, i would say it's is a much more flexible um understanding of uh, discreteness and digital materials as the one that i was uh, framing before with examples like uh, neil gersenfall uh whereas um, these pieces could could be slight variations of a, of a core piece they don't need to be identical, but they need to follow these certain parameters. And this would allow the, the kind of the, the robust manufacturing method to proceed fully, right? So once I have prototyped one, in this case, the, the one on the, on the very far, uh, I know certainly that changing the height of it, changing it slightly the shape will not affect the robustness of the, of the manufacturing method. 
Um, so in this case, we kind of play with a, with a variation of a different uh, lens of this object so that it can be reconfigured to go from uh, furniture to a small architecture or even larger. Um, we made a test assembly of, uh, of this for uh, the v and Museum. And I'll show it in a second. And uh, we also started encoding the, the possibilities on, uh, on the combinatorial uh, process of, of, of these pieces, right? So the idea is that there is an, um, uh, a very direct link between the organization that you, you start envisioning in the, in, in the computer, in the software, and the way that information is translated to the machine to manufacture these pieces very, very efficiently. So effectively, it is just a push of a button that um, the software would identify the different lengths and because it, it has prototyped these pieces before, uh, we could very, very efficiently produce the pieces that you need to assemble this or any other um, structure. And so that is the, the assembly that we produce for the VNA. I will expand in a second. And uh, this is, like, this were the very early kind of test on uh, prototyping this. And then very, very quickly, we accelerate in our production since we, we, knew, we certainly knew that these pieces would work uh, to massively uh, produce more and more pieces. Uh, in here, we were uh, testing the connections. It's a very efficient uh, kind of uh, connection uh, method uh, that just literally requires uh, four, four screws. It could be assembled in just a matter of a few hours, like in this case, in, in I think around three hours, uh, we assemble this uh, prototype in the, in the V&A uh, Museum in, in London, and then it was later disassemble, uh, get gotten back to uh, these good pieces and then mounted back in in uh, in Prague um, for the for the architectural uh, biennale. Um, so let's say when when uh, is, is scaling is scaling up these processes again, of course we we uh, start seeing its opportunities with with other materials as well, right? Uh, so we've done some uh, testing on uh, using our polymers as uh, 3D printed formwork uh, so that we can have this dynamic serialization and, and, and variable uh, connectivity as well. And we're exploring that uh, further in a housing project. Uh, so this is um, it's a, it's a project that is, is really trying to cha challenge the, the uh, assembly line at uh, a housing uh, scale, right? Um, and it's kind of in comparison to, or it, it really kind of um, uh, taps into some of the discussion that Jean, Jean Prouvé uh, was outlining uh, on offsite uh, um, manufacturing on, on, on housing and treating this uh, like housing as a, as a kit of parts. But, in, in contrast with uh, Jean Prouvé, um, we are decentralizing this model completely. So we start to really um, bypass uh, the scale limitations that he was facing when he had to uh, ship the, the, house, the entire house in a large format plane. Um, so and, uh, it's, a, it's a prototype that we're uh, firstly building in, in, uh, in Avila, in our, in our hometown, uh, which is also starting to open up uh, other kind of social questions. Like this is how Avila has uh, looked like for the last 10 years after the last crisis. So it's completely urbanized and it's just waiting for something to happen there. It's just um, the uh, crisis um, basically dynamite the entire construction industry in a small cities in, in, in Spain and, and, and mainly in Southern uh, Europe. And uh, we're wondering if a more distributed system to create housing um, could lead to a higher efficiency on the use of, uh, of this uh, land to make it inhabitable. Um, so 
the the process that we're uh, following is is again a series of very very simple uh, pieces that we can uh, quickly prototype and that play within the limitations that that we have on our robotic printing process. In this case, it's a, a three meter and a, and a half piece that could be assembled in a multiplicity of ways. This is this is still a work in progress, but just to give an example, these are the pieces to create this prototype, but also. Uh, this, this other one. So there is the possibility of this recombinatorial um, uh, process before the, the uh, assembly. And, um, and it's, it's starting to also kind of reconsider the, the role of, uh, you know, services, architectural elements, uh, furniture within the architectural scheme. So um, can 3D printing start to blend, blend all these objects into into a, 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 a mutated architectural piece that is uh, neither services, not the structural, uh, not cladding, but it, it has aspects of uh, all of these architectural elements together, right? And those are some of the very interesting questions that we're uh, trying to ask ourselves uh, continuously, both in the, in the lab and in, and in the company. At the, at the level, so uh, now going back down in the scale, uh, at the level of, of material, right? Um, serializing errors starts to happen at the, yeah, almost at, at the understanding of the particle that conforms architecture. So if you get these uh, discrete uh, pieces uh, smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and, and you think it within a, a 3D printing umbrella, uh, you are ending up in a line fragment, right? The, the same line, fra line fragment that we were describing before for creating uh, a continuous curve. So then the, the, the way you are dealing with this uh, line fragment for 3D printing relies on the way you are combining it to generate a continuous line. So how can this line fragment uh, rotate the scale up and down uh, to connect with with the previous with the previous uh, uh, fragment to create a continuous line that you can just bring with a robot. So we did some very early uh, kind of more abstract uh, experiments on combinatorial processes of uh, very simple lines. Uh, in here, just trying to identify through uh, rotations if, uh, if you can start generating continuity in the line so the robot wouldn't uh, stop the printing process at, at any moment and um, so we very soon started creating um, a software um, which we call discrete design software uh, that would allow us to um, test this like multiplicity of structural scenarios uh, within an object in this case was a, a pantom chair for distributing uh, different line fragments within it. So in this case we use, well, four line fragments. In reality it's kind of two and the mirror versions. So the, the, the ones in the, in the left are three-dimensional line fragments and the ones in the right are flat. Um, so you can see here uh, the kind of the, the, the different, um, the, the way these, these lines could morph and rotate, right? Uh, so that they can always offer support to the previous line. So if we would test this line in each four different rotations, and we test the connectivity to the same line in, again, another four rotations, we can prototype um, the, the entire chair in a local manner. Right? If we know that that uh, line fragment is printable, and the entire object is built out of a combination of these line fragments, that means that the entire object should be printed, right? And we, we don't have to worry about uh, the printing crossing uh, at the very end of the, the process. So we started uh, prot prototyping that, that uh, testing different materials, different pigments, um, different, yeah, different colorants, different uh, ways of uh, connecting them together until we started to get to the right one. Like the one that you see on the, on the right is uh, combining both the, the uh, aerial uh, 3D printing, right? Um, and the uh, layer by layer one in the middle of the, of the, of the object. So yeah, you can uh, see it here. Um, 
basically to, to explain this a little bit further, uh, you can see in the object in the diagram on the right, the right hand side, the, uh, there is a level of uh, subdivisions of these voxels. Uh, although in, the, in this case, we're actually not subdividing the, the voxel, but we're just assigning it a, a structural value, right? So we're running on a structural um, analysis through a phone object, in this case, a phantom chair, right? And then distributing these different levels accordingly. Um, the line types will be then be assigned to uh, a range of values. So, for example, if your uh, if the the um, level of stress is very low, um, you can be assigned uh, a 3D type of line, which will be printed in there. So it, it will be slightly weaker, but in that area you don't need a higher strength. However, if your uh, the level of stress in a certain area is very high you want to have uh, a much denser material organization there which will be achievable by uh, combining flat line, lines instead so the two-dimensional type of lines will be more uh, linked to uh, the areas that require a higher um, that have a higher level of, of, of stress so um, you see here kind of the, the workflow. We get a, an object and we run a structure analysis over it. And uh, that leads to a, a different level of um, stress in each of the voxels that you've gotten from, from the object. And, uh, and then we start uh, distributing uh, these lines accordingly. Um, to the level of stress. So in here, for example, you see the, um, the uh, part on the left or the beginning of the chair is, well, okay, that was, I think I, I saw that part. That, yeah, well, you see it here in like the different layers, how uh, sometimes uh, you have a higher density in the, in the bottom because this is where this chair is supporting a person and sometimes it dematerializing towards the top because it doesn't have such a high uh, level of, uh, of tension. And, um, and we started tweaking this uh, mass balance and, and the, the structural scenarios to uh, create a multiplicity of different objects. So um, that the, the voxel chair is not only the one chair, but is is the the system behind it, right? Is is the code that is underlining the the design method of uh, this line fragment within within an object. So these are uh, different variations of this uh, voxel chair that are distributing the mass of the object differently, right? Um, we started printing it, and uh, this was actually the very very first project or serious project that, that Nagami took, took on board. Uh, so this was in our very first space that was almost as big as you see in the screen uh, with our very first second hand uh, robot. And uh, yeah, it was a, an in, in incredibly fascinating and tiring process simultaneously. So that's printing continuously. Basically, the entire chair is made out of a 2.4 kilometer line, right? Which is again based on a repetition on a, on the same of the same uh, the same line fragment. So you can see here this kind of differentiation in, in density from like the part on the right that is is more porous uh, because it has less structural requirement to the part on the left that is is denser. Uh, in, in some of these details. So the chair became uh, part of the uh, permanent exhibition of the, of the Centre Pompidou, which was great, was also exhibited in the, in the Pompidou Canal, right? And, but then uh, we started also creating a second version of the, of the chair and perfectioning uh, its system so it can it can print faster and we did that uh, now this is our our new uh, space in Avila we did that for the Philadelphia uh, Museum of uh, Art it was uh, recently uh, exhibited uh, there and it actually got uh, quite a quite a good kind of uh, welcome from 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 the press um, but at the same time 
impact in the media with like 2 million views, but at the same time, it generated 800 uh, negative comments, right? Uh, which I think uh, for us was, was very interesting as, in, as not thinking about these objects as a chair, but then also start thinking about its opportunities to uh, go beyond uh, the exhibition piece that, that it is, right? I, I think if I, if I described kind of the, the, the evolution of the company, we always had in mind that doing products that would be more accessible, but we needed, we needed to, um, we knew that we needed to start from a higher uh, media impact and, and a project that would be extremely challenging and, and creative in the way we are using uh, 3D print technology. So we jumped into a, a second version of, uh, of uh, this object when we, we can start exploring the potentials of the, this method further. And we did that together with, uh, with Vicente Soler who created the plugin uh, robots for, for Grasshopper, uh, which is the plugin that most, most people are actually using. So this is the second version of the software uh, written with Vicente, uh, which is developed in, in, in Unity. And it's trying to kind of, uh, on one hand, automate much more of the process. And, um, and on the other, um, allowing you for a, um, a greater flexibility, right? So you are not so limited to just having a, a, a boxy looking object, but we started to introduce new features, like for example, the surface wrappings, wrappings so the, the, the lines could adapt to a different uh, surface condition. And we tested this in, in a new object uh, that we call the Obonori uh, chest Um So here you can see the, yeah, the way we are um, finding paths. I'm gonna stop there for a second. So, <clears throat> And this is a Hamiltonian path uh, that is basically connecting all the cells in one layer so that the, the path uh, passes by one of these centers only once, right? This was a, quite a computational uh, challenge. And uh, it is basically generated now here per layer. So you can see the, the efficiency of the, the printing. This is basically the printing order. What you are seeing right now in the, in the screen is the, the direction of, of these cells and then how they rotate differently to uh, connect together in, uh, to give a, a, a print, printing uh, order in every one of, of these layers, right? Yeah, so um, this is the, the object that we, we um, generated with this uh, second software. I'm gonna go a little bit quicker. The, the software also um, implements an, an integration with the, with the robots plugin so that you can actually check the printability at every case, right? So you, you could change the, the line fragment type and check it within the entire object to, to make sure that is printable according to certain parameters that have been tested before with our technology. So therefore, we could now even serialize the errors within the digital domain without having to produce further um, printing physical testing. Uh, so yeah, that's, that, that's kind of, uh, you see the, the mass variation in the, in the object as well responding to, again, the same uh, structure analysis. And this is how the, the object stands. Yeah, I think that was a video. Yeah, so this is a, a kind of a quick uh, fly through this, um, this object. So, so you, can, you can start to see also this potential of the, of the uh, discrete design process for 3D printing uh, within uh, other areas, such as comfort and so on, right? So in here, we don't have a boxy object anymore, but we're starting to adapt these line fragments to, um, to a concrete surface, and, uh, and we can start envisioning internal lattices to objects and so on that are taking advantage of, of our printing process 
uh, but that are not becoming a compromise in the formal uh, aspect of the, of the piece. Anyway, I think that is, I wanted to finish there uh, since that, that is something that Jan will um, kind of uh, explain in more, more detail through um, uh, programming and, and, and grasshopper. So Jan has been a very kind to uh, offer to create a, a version of, um, of this uh, voxelization and line fragment combination um, uh, project and, and share it with all of you. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, really uh, in, intrigued by what will come out of it, uh, looking forward and thrilled to uh, see this method uh, develop in a different scenario and be offered to all of you guys in, online. So um, with that said, uh, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm not sure if I was in time or not today. Uh, I will leave it there and um, I, I am obviously open to take questions if uh, you guys have any, anything. Uh, Thank you very much for, uh, for both of the lectures. They were not only uh, informative, but they were incredibly impressive. Uh, congratulations on, on the wonderful work and on the amount of very, very high quality work. Um, um, it's stunning. Thanks. Uh, there is a question. Uh, there has been a question uh, throughout your presentation. I didn't want to interrupt you, uh, but I think you um, meanwhile answered that. But but still, uh, have you ever combined plastics uh, and other material in your works, like waste materials? Mm -hmm. uh, combined plastic and wasted material. Yeah, I mean that's kind of uh, uh, what we're doing with recycling plastic um, so I mean we're kind of shifting most of the our our production to uh, recycle plastic uh, PET from from uh, barley ocean plastic uh, we've been experimented in different kind of materials uh, like we started with uh, PLA and I mean PLA has advantages for being biodegradable but to be honest it would not fully biodegrade in the next couple hundred years. So it's not such an immediate solution and uh, it is an incredibly weak plastic. So we shifted uh, to PETG, which is a very clean production. It's, uh, it's, um, it's not flammable. Uh, it's 99% recycled. Uh, it doesn't uh, lose properties when you do. So we use a lot of recycled PETG as well. And uh, I think that is, is, I mean, it's definitely something that we want to implement more and more and more. Um, if, if the question is more also, um, which I think is interesting to, um, yeah, get other kind of materials in the mix. I mean, this is something that we, I mean, including myself, we, we underestimate a lot uh, as architects, like the world of uh, material science. Um, like even within plastics, every plastic is different. Like every plastic has this different melting point, a different kind of set of temperatures and constraints, and, and, uh, and it, it requires a different finish for the, the interior of the chamfer or the extruder. And it's like you need to, like seriously, a few, few months or more of technical development when you want to change from one plastic to a similar one. Um, introducing other things in the mix is, I think it's interesting and it's been um, done also in the academic um, environment where you can go much more DIY, but then uh, obviously the, the, the result is never as compelling as, as something that could be in the market tomorrow, right? So although it is uh, very interesting for us to explore new materials, um, I think it, it is probably a bit more, um, um, how to say, it's more efficient for us <laughs> to in, in, increase what we can do with the material we have and make it more and more and more and more efficient every time, make it more, uh, yeah, like basically more on recycled materials and so on. And at some point, hopefully we're big enough to bifurcate into a, different kind of research and a different uh, kind of material as well. I mean, we've done experiments uh, also with 
printing concrete. We also do like robotic CNC and so on, but things that more or less we knew how they work. But at a more serious industrial level, we tend to uh, stick with the, the material that we, we were kind of based, based on from the beginning for the moment. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions or comments or anything? I'm also checking Facebook, uh, but it seems like, uh, no. Ryan Manning is uh, sending some pandas. Um, oh, thank you, Ryan. <laughs> I need some pandas. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, there is another question. Uh, while conducting your works, is there a time to get uh, inspired from nature, uh, likewise from or just uh, as mentioned uh, now material? Um, but, well, I I understood the question whether you get inspired from the material uh, only or also from from the nature. Hmm. Well, I, I think, um, yeah, I, it's actually an interesting question. Um, I, I think my, my generation started to, um, you know, the, we, we kind of like kept a very special place for nature, but we acknowledge the artificiality of the world, you know, and um, if, you, if you have a, like a quick sweep through the, the last 10 years of computational design, right? Um, the early stages was about this softness because it was like, fascinating to have, yeah, these continuous surfaces and so on. The second stage though, was to start to recreate uh, algorithms to simulate nature, right? And um, I'm, I'm talking like 10 years ago, um, and I, I still do today, and I think it is, it is very, it's incredibly interesting. Like I, uh, some of my colleagues, like uh, Andy Lomas, who is an incredible uh, artist, and uh, he's really going to an, an exploration level when, when he starts kind of being uh, admiring nature, understanding nature, recreating nature, and then evolving nature towards something artificial, right? And I think that is when it becomes interesting, like to understand the, the way these natural uh, processes uh, occur at a more fundamental level, not at a formal level, and, um, and then push them forward to, to create your, your own nature, <laughs> right? And I think that that's what becomes very interesting. So, so we kind of think our generation, or at least my group within that generation, kind of rejected the, the naturally inspired algorithms and we started creating other kind of algorithms um, but it's not that we we eliminated it completely from our inspirational tool sets but i think we started to understand understanding differently and uh, to appreciate their their dialogue with the artificial and uh, i i think that was that was also one of the steps towards um kind of uh, at admitting the coldness on, a, on automation that was also driven by algorithms. And uh, even if the result would look like a bunch of boxes uh, and not, not like, you know, uh, trees and naturally inspired forms, uh, we knew that the computational process behind it was certainly uh, sharing a lot of the syntax. And I think that that was incredibly a revealing moment uh, for us, I think, and it, and is defining also the aesthetical values that the generation has. We keep talking about the same stuff uh, throughout this uh, this uh, workshop. It's uh, uh, morphogenesis and and how to when you look at nature, you are thinking about, uh, thinking about the processes rather than the forms and and so on and so on. Uh, we also mentioned uh, Andy Lomas yesterday, so uh, I'm very happy that all these things keep keep returning. Um, uh, speaking of which, uh, there was uh, uh, there was 
a presentation yesterday of uh, studios of computational design that are uh, happening here in this uh, region. And uh, some of them were actually showing uh, your schemes, uh, exactly the same pictures that you are showing. You are credited, of course, but um, you can see that these things are uh, interconnected and, and relevant and you are being cited. That, that's <laughs> cool. <laughs> that's nice for you. <laughs> I want to see it. <laughs> oh, wait. Can you, yeah. I, I, I stopped sharing so I can see your face too. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's, uh, that was unnecessary. Anyway, um, uh, let, let's wrap it up for now. Uh, thank you very, very much. It was incredible. And um, if you're okay with uh, keeping this online, I, I would be very delighted. I will also then send you a links to, um, to the content uh, that will be preserved. Um, shall we arrange the last session, the, 